Well, welcome back. Nice to uh, see you on. I think my mic, my little red lights are on, so I think I'm, I'm okay. Uh, nice to see you all. It just seems like last Sunday, doesn't it, that we were all here and the summer's gone by and now we're back. And so it's a delight to welcome you all. As you know, we are uh, shifting gears uh, and starting off this morning in a series that will continue probably through this church school year. That's what I'm envisioning in the uh, book of Genesis. Uh, in case you're wondering how that uh, decision was made, um, I'm taking it as a word from the Lord. I was I really, last spring doing the Minor Prophets, I really wasn't sure what to do this fall. I had some ideas bouncing around and nothing really seemed right. And uh, somebody just came up after Sunday school class one morning. A faithful member of this class just walked up to me and said, you know, young man, you should do Genesis next fall. It just seemed like the lights came on. <laughs> it just seemed like the right thing. So here we are doing Genesis. So that's, uh, that's what we'll be doing. Uh, Genesis is quite an undertaking. You probably uh, would uh, guess that. Uh, Genesis, the first book of the Bible. It's been uh, said many times that any time the Bible says something for the first time, it always tends to be very important, very significant. And you can imagine in Genesis, just about all the first times that things are said are found there. Uh, the various themes that come up uh, throughout the scriptures are many times uh, invoked, first of all, in uh, this book of Genesis, and many times in most intriguing ways. So whether it's uh, those more common themes that we would think of, of creation and redemption, or the idea of sacrament and covenant, the notion of God having a chosen people, uh, all of these and many other themes come, first of all, in the book of Genesis, and many times in ways that uh, condition everything else, every other occasion that these themes are revisited. It, in many cases, is referring back to and remembering and presupposing our familiarity with that initial uh, suggestion of it that we find from Genesis. And so we need to be somewhat uh, thoughtful and cautious as we go along to make sure that we don't uh, lose some of that significance. I uh, have, as I've been um, thinking about Genesis, I actually, my original thought was to start in uh, chapter 12. And I was going to call this series Faith of Our Fathers. That seemed like a good idea. And then as I began uh, preparing this summer, I was really seized with guilt at skipping over those first 11 chapters. And I'm just going to be real straight up honest with you. I've always struggled a bit with those first 11 chapters. I was real comfortable with the thought of jumping in with the life of Abraham. Uh, but those first 11 chapters, they, they kind of stand out there by themselves. In fact, in fact some have argued that they uh, were actually an addition to Genesis, that Genesis properly begins with the story of Abraham and and those first chapters came later. I don't believe that. I don't follow that. But uh, uh, that's how different they are, that you would actually have people making such an argument. Anyway, as I was thinking about uh, Genesis this summer, I decided, no, uh, I, I can't skip over them. So I'm going to compromise. We're not going to cover them uh, chapter by chapter. We're going to spend four weeks on those first 11 chapters. And then we'll slow down with the life of Abraham and probably move more at a our standard rate of about one chapter a week. The great themes that come out of those first 11 chapters uh, deal with God and humanity, whereas when we get to chapter 12, it's more God and redeemed humanity, as uh, God calls Abraham from Ur, of the, from Mesopotamia, from the Chaldees. And uh, so these first 11 chapters are different in that respect, that we're dealing with a sense in which God is addressing himself to the great sweep of human life, human history, the relationship that humanity has generally to the deity, as opposed to those more precise themes that come out with respect to God's redemptive activity, calling, providing sacrifice, and so on. And uh, all of those things make these chapters most interesting, and as I say, somewhat different. The uh, four great themes, or at least events that we'll find here, and we'll spend four weeks looking at each of these in turn, are first of all creation, chapter 1, and then the fall of the human race, 
chapters 2, 3, and 4. The flood, Noah's flood, chapters 6 through 9. Uh, And then finally, the distribution of the nations, that great event that more or less conditions then subsequent history, uh, centered in the story of the Tower of Babel and uh, leading us to a a kind of setting up then an understanding of the nation states of the ancient world that become players then as, uh, as the subsequent history unfolds. So we'll be looking at each of those in turn, uh, four weeks on those four themes, and then we'll pick up uh, uh, at the end of that with the story of Abraham and press on from there. So anyway, this morning what I'd like to do is read uh, chapter 1. Uh, it's somewhat lengthy. We won't be reading all of this, but uh, chapter 1 of Genesis is so lofty. Even if it were all by itself, as a little piece of ancient literature, it would be remarkable. The fact that it's the first chapter of the Bible is highly appropriate because it sets in motion a whole sweeping panoramic understanding of creation and reality. There are problems in chapter 1. There are perplexing questions. Uh, and uh, I think you'll detect those as we go along. And yet at the same time, there's something so dignified about the entire way in which the matter is described that no one can help but be impressed. So we're going to read it. If you have uh, uh, the Pew Bible, I will refer to you to page one. <laughs> Pretty easy to find, isn't it? Page one. And before we start, let me just mention three terms in advance uh, before we read it. Uh, The first of these is in verse 2. You'll notice it says there, uh, uh, the darkness covered the face of the deep while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. That word wind is the Hebrew word ruach, which actually is also translated spirit. And so if you're familiar with the uh, more traditional translations, you know that it typically reads, the spirit of God brooded over the waters. That idea. But it can also be wind, the wind of God. There's an ambiguity there. Same way with the Greek word pneuma, which can mean either wind or spirit. Ruach, the Hebrew word, has the same kind of uh, sort of flexibility. The second word I want to call your attention to is down in verse 6. And God said, let there be a dome. A dome. Now, again, if you're familiar with the more traditional versions, you know the word that's used there is the word firmament, which literally, it's a tough word, Uh, probably the best stab at what it means is the idea of a great expanse. It seems to refer generally to the sky or to the atmosphere. Uh, It doesn't really mean dome per se. This was the translators trying to give us a feel for what was probably intended by that word. But the point of it is from a, from a vantage point of human perception, if you walk outside on a sunny day like today and look up into the blue sky, it appears to be a great dome, doesn't it? And that's the idea that's suggested by that. The third word I want to uh, refer you to before we read this is in verse 26. This is my little quibble with the uh, tendency for this translation to be a little bit too politically correct. Uh, here it says, and, let it, and God said, let us make humankind. Well, the Hebrew word is Adam, Adam, man. And I think it kind of upsets the sense of the text to try to shuffle around that evil word, M-A-N. So I'm going to use it, okay? And I hope I don't uh, disturb anybody by doing that, but I think it'll make that little paragraph uh, read a little bit more uh, uh, correctly if we do so. I will read down to the first uh, four verses of chapter 2. And so let's go ahead and take a look at this. This is Genesis Chapter 1, verse 1, this is the Word of God. In the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. 
So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so. God called the dome sky. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth. And the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees of every kind on the earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. And the earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years and let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created great sea monsters, and every living creature that moves of every kind which the waters swarm, and every winged bird of every kind, and God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things, and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind and the cattle of every kind and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God said to them, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit, and you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I've given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he'd made, and indeed, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all their multitude. And on the seventh day God finished the work he had done and he rested on the seventh day from the work he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it because on it God rested from all the work he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Our Father, we are grateful for this great, lofty, sweeping description of your magnificent power. We pray that as we just very briefly and inadequately explore only a few thoughts from this great text, that at the same time you would somehow impress us with that which is vastly beyond human description. That is that you are God and that you create out of nothing all of this, this glorious theater that confronts us day by day. We pray that our reflection on these matters would draw us closer to you and closer to Christ, in whose name we offer these prayers. 
Amen. Well, I'll tell you, we could spend an entire year on that chapter, and uh, we're not going to. Uh, it would be fun, and I would certainly uh, reach my level of uh, perplexity and confusion quickly on many occasions, but uh, I do want to at least address a few uh, kind of passing thoughts here and organize our thinking around three simple questions. Uh, and the questions are, what, who, and why? So those are my questions. Uh, what, who, and why uh, from this text? The what question uh, is really this one. It's, it's my substitute for the question of when. You probably are aware that uh, there's a raging debate. It continues. It has gone on for many years. It continues to this very day. Even as I speak, I'm sure somewhere somebody is debating this point, and it's this question. When did these things happen? You know. And you've got two schools of thought. You've got the so-called young earth folks who say it all happened around 6,000 years ago that uh, if you use a Bible, the chronology of the Bible and take it seriously, that you can date this back to somewhere around the year 4000 B.C. And so if you're a real Bible believer, then you, in fact, affirm that all of the creation and earth and all of these things came into being about 4, 000, or 6,000 years ago at the year 4000 B.C. And then there are those equally sincere Christians who take an equally high view of the Scriptures. This is not a liberals versus conservatives type of debate necessarily. So there are those who take a very high, serious view of the Scriptures who would nevertheless say, no, we are not bound by what the you know, text says, certainly not by Genesis 1, to a concept of the, the earth being created 6,000 years ago. We can allow for what at least seems to be the consensus opinion out there among people who think about these things that the earth and the universe may be much older than that. Uh, as much as, you know, the current number I think is about 15.3 billion years old. And that that still is permissible without doing violence to what the scripture is saying. You know. Do you want to know what the correct answer is to that? <laughs> so do I. <laughs> And uh, I just, it'll probably never happen in my lifetime. I'm hoping someday somebody resolves that question to the satisfaction of Christian people. Because as a matter of fact, Christians, you know, are at war with some Christians over that issue. Now I have to say, I'm not so sure that's really where we should be putting in our heavy strokes here. But nevertheless, uh, that debate goes on. I'm not going to address that. Uh, just to be perfectly candid with you, you know, I'm not going to be candid with you, so uh, we'll just leave it at that. But what I, do want to talk, what I do want to address is not so much the when issue, but the what issue. The point of this is not so much when did this all happen, but what are we dealing with? What is the significance of this that we call creation? And while this is not an exhaustive answer, it's one sort of angle on the answer. And to get us there, I'd like to remind you that in addition to Genesis chapter 1, we have a chapter in the New Testament, another first chapter. In this case, it's the book of Romans, which I think gives us at least a helpful lens by which to look back on the significance of Genesis chapter 1. And that text is Romans chapter 1 from the pen of the Apostle Paul, written about 57 A.D. to the Romans from Corinth. And there he launches his great, more or less, theological philosophy of the significance of creation. I know many of you are familiar with it, but let me just remind you of at least part of what he says there. Paul says, the wrath of God, that is the anger of God, is revealed from heaven. Not concealed. In, in other words, the fact that God is angry is disclosed. It's not a secret. Is revealed from heaven toward the ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress that truth in their unrighteousness. The fact that God is angry with human sin is not a secret. That's what Paul is saying. And then he goes on to say this, because that which may be known about God is plain to them, that is to humanity. 
That which may be known about God is plain to them because God made it plain to them. Then he says, because since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, namely his eternal power, his divine nature, these invisible, remarkable aspects of God that we cannot see directly, Paul says, since the creation of the world, the invisible things of God are plainly seen through what he has made so that they are without excuse. Now, what Paul is saying there is this that we are surra- with, with which we are surrounded, this creation, ever since its very moment of first existence, has been, as Calvin calls it, a glorious theater. And as we walk through this glorious theater, we are constantly confronted with the inescapable proof that God is there. That however we want to, you know, slice and dice the timing of it, however we want to try to get down to the nuts and bolts of how exactly it happened and what order in which it took place and all of these sorts of interesting questions, one thing we cannot escape is that as you look out at all of that, God is behind it. And the face of God is looking at you through it. Now some people say, well, I'm not so sure about that. I mean, I think I can explain adequately how all this came by natural causes, purposeless forces acting through history, time plus space plus chance plus matter, and blah, here we are. And that sounds pretty, you know, that, that, that may sound somewhat appealing now, but let me tell you, according to the Apostle Paul, when a person tries out that excuse and they stand before God on Judgment Day, it's going to sound highly inadequate, you see. And at that point, it'll be perfectly obvious then what is in fact perfectly obvious now, that all of this drives us, drives us to the inescapable reality of God's great infinite power, his eternal um, glory, and all of that is seen through this creation. So, whatever else we do with Genesis 1, we should do that. We should recognize that part of what that chapter is saying to us is what Paul echoes later. That all of this glorious theater is showing us God. Now, it's not showing us all of God that we could possibly learn. The Bible was given to supplement substantially what we would otherwise probably not be able to figure out simply by reflecting on nature. But the psalmist says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The earth displays his handiwork day by day, night by night. They all utter God's knowledge, you see. That's the biblical posture. Personally, I think it's the rational posture. And that's at least part of what this story of creation is telling us. So that's one. What? What is this creation? I like Calvin's term, a glorious theater. All right, second question, who? Who? Now, you might think, well, that's, you know, obviously the player here, as we look at the creation account, is God himself, and that's a given. But I have something else in mind, and for this I'd like to refer you to another first chapter, again in the New Testament. This time it's the Gospel of John. Uh, In John, chapter 1, you know, John uh, gives us those familiar words, in the beginning was the Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Greek there is in RK, in beginning, en ho logos, was the Word. Now, people who've looked at that closely recognize immediately that John is clearly borrowing the very same language that's used in Genesis chapter 1 in the Septuagint version, which was the commonly used version even in Palestine in the first century, the Greek version of the Hebrew Old Testament, which begins with the same words, in R.K. In R.K., in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. John clearly wants the reader of his, his letter or his gospel to think about Genesis 1 when he says, in R.K. But he goes a little different direction there, doesn't he? So he says, in the beginning was the Word, the Logos. 
Now, why would he say that? Well, of course, if we go back and look at Genesis 1, it doesn't take us long to see what is evidently the reason. Because, uh, as you probably noticed, as you go through Genesis 1, you'll notice the repeated phrase that comes up again and again, all the way through, and it's the phrase, uh, we see it for the first time uh, in verse 3, then God said. Verse 6, and God said. Verse 9, and God said, let the waters under the sky. Verse 14, and God said. Verse 20, and God said. All the way through, who's he talking to? Talking to himself? Who's God addressing here? And God said. Why doesn't it just say, and God created? And God made the light. And God you know, did all of these things. But it always introduces that little uh, piece of the description. And God said, let there be light. And this whole idea that God's word has power is shot through right off the bat. The very beginning of this great account of creation. John comes along in the Gospel of John and says, let me tell you what this saying is about. In the beginning was the Word, was God's speech, was God's utterance, this powerful, creative, unleashed display of God's creative ability came through His Word. And then John says, and oh, by the way, the Word... The word that God spoke is actually that which has become flesh. And John, of course, ties all of that to creation. You know the language there in John 1. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. You see, in other words, the Logos, Christ, is a player right off the bat. Jesus is as much a participant in the creation narrative, according to John, as God is. That the God spoke, the speech there, in a sense, is giving us in some sort of, some sort of way an understanding that Christ himself, the Logos, is participating. Uh, Paul tells us over in Colossians chapter 2 the same thing, using a slightly different sort of vocabulary, he describes the centrality of Christ to all of creation. He says, all things were made by him. All things were made for him. He is prior to all things, and by him all things hang together. As if to say, Christ himself is the very glue that keeps all of the created order intact. The next breath you take depends on the power of Christ maintaining this universe. That's the biblical idea. Jesus is not just an add-on module, you know. Jesus is part and parcel of the very order of creation, outside of it, eternally outside of it, and yet that by which the very creation itself maintains its integrity. And so that's the second thing. When we think about the creation account, we have the what, a great theater, the who, Christ. He's the who of creation, you see. And even though Genesis 1 doesn't use that language explicitly, it uses it strongly, impliedly, as John uh, uh, leads us to understand. This brings us to the third and diciest uh, aspect of the, uh, the, the issue, which is the why. Uh, what exactly, and, and the why here again I don't mean in the broadest cosmic sense we could say, well, the why is to the glory of God or something like that. But I, I'm meaning something a, a little bit more precise than that as we think about the question of the why. And on this, on this ground, I, I have to frankly admit I, uh, I get a little bit um, nervous. My palms get a little bit sweaty. And so if you notice that uh, in my presentation, you'll just have to... Um, uh, forgive me for it, but uh, it's because I, I realize I'm kind of right on the edge, and some of you may uh, wonder a little bit about where I'm going here. But I'm going to uh, sally forth courageously, nevertheless, uh, in this direction. Um, this really, you know, let me just open the issue by asking you this question. What, when we read Genesis chapter 1, what exactly are we reading there? 
Now, there are those who would say that, uh, you know, we're dealing with essentially a blow-by-blow description of basically what happened. There was a 24-hour period, and in that 24 hours, God did something. And then there was a next 24-hour period, and God did something else. And you can actually go back, and if we could be there with newspaper, uh, you know, accounts and TV cameras, we could take pictures of that, except God hadn't created the stuff to make cameras yet, but you understand. If we could, we could actually see all of that happening, in a sense, as if it were a kind of narrative. All right, six days of creation, and very, um, uh, you know, well-intentioned and well-informed Christian people take that position very seriously, so I'm not disparaging that view at all. The question that I think uh, sometimes comes up, however, is, is this first chapter of Genesis intended to be something like a newspaper account? Is that, as they say, the literary genre that we're dealing with in that chapter? Uh, It's a fair question. This is not an attempt to try to avoid uh, the force of Scripture or to take a view of Scripture that uh, diminishes its authority or anything like that. Uh, Because every time we read the Bible, regardless of what text it might be, we always have to ask the question, as an initial inquiry, what kind of literature am I dealing with here? We have to ask that question to make sense out of the words on the page, you see. uh, We've been studying the 23rd Psalm, as you know, this summer. The 23rd Psalm says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Now, what do you take that to mean? Is it reasonable to take that text to mean that Christ actually grabs me by the nap of the neck and drags me out into a meadow and forces me to lie down on some wet grass beside a little pool of water? Is that part and parcel of the meaning of that text And unless I take it to mean that, I'm really denying the Bible and its authority. Is that what that means? Well, I hope you don't think that. I I think we all sort of intuitively recognize that's poetry. And it's a wonderful poetic expression of the fact that Christ cares for me as a shepherd cares for his sheep. And that to be led out by this wonderful, you know, kind of idyllic situation of still waters and grass and so on is supposed to lead me to a vastly more important insight about things, namely that God is watching over the welfare of my soul. And He gives me comfort when things might seem a little bit uh, difficult. And even if I'm going through the valley of the shadow of death, He's with me and He's caring for me. And that's really what that text is trying to communicate. And if we went a different direction, we'd miss the basic point that the psalmist was trying to get over to us. You see that. So that's why I say when we read any text of the Scripture, we've got to ask the question, what kind of literature is it? Is it a poem? Is it a psalm? Is it historical narrative? Certainly the Bible is filled with historical narrative. We need to take that seriously. Is it apocalyptic literature? Is it some other kind of literature? That's all legitimate inquiry, and it's a threshold question. Okay. Well, I come to Genesis chapter 1, I say, what kind of literature is this? Now, it's it's not an easy question. And I don't mean to suggest to you that uh, there's unanimity, you know, in the house of uh, uh, Christian scholars on this point. But I think anyone that reads it, even casually, you don't need to be a Bible scholar to figure this out. Just a casual reading of Genesis chapter 1 at least suggests the possibility that there's something else going on here than simply newspaper reporting as such, a kind of rigid, chronological, step-by-step, day-by-day delineation of what God did in, you know, six consecutive 24-hour periods. Not to say God couldn't have done it that way. You know, I'm not denying the power of God here. I'm simply asking the question, what is this text leading us to as an understanding of what God did? So far, so good. Okay, with that, you see that? That's, uh, that's really the idea. All right, well, now, if I'm not in trouble yet, let me try a little harder. One of the things that uh, occurs to me, and I think has occurred to many as they've read, Gen- read Genesis chapter 1, is that as you look at this narrative, you find it bears striking similarity to the view of the universe that was common and current in the ancient Near Eastern world. 
Okay? That as we read the text of Genesis chapter 1, we find that there are at least apparently some assumptions there which are quite compatible with the way in which the ancient Near Easterns viewed the universe. Now, this shouldn't come as a big shock because actually, if we didn't know better, it's probably the same way we would view the universe. It's called a sort of phenomenological view of things. I was saying earlier, if you walk outside and just look. Now, we've all been to school. We know that the, you know, the, the, um, the sun is out there and the earth goes around it. We have solar systems and galaxies. And in fact, Mars was pretty close to us here recently. Did you look at Mars through the telescope? I did. That was kind of cool. You know, we, we know all of that. But actually, if you just went out and looked at things, you wouldn't necessarily be able to immediately see all of that, because what appears to the human eye is an appearance of a kind of flat land covered by a great blue dome, right? And in some sense or other, some idea that there must be something down beneath. And the ancient Near Easterners, uh, those people in Mesopotamia, Sumer, you know, Acadia, those places, they, they basically reflected that view of things in their understanding of, of uh, you know, how creation occurred. Uh, probably the most famous, um, um, I'll call it the famous, famous creation myth that comes down from ancient Mesopotamian literature is called Enuma Elish. I suspect probably at least somebody here has read that. Enuma Elish, E-N-U-M-A-E-L-I-S-H. And uh, it's a bizarre and fanciful description of creation. Uh, but one thing it presupposes is this idea that there is this great, watery, unordered, kind of chaotic mass. And then God, or not God, but in this case, uh, a bunch of gods in all kinds of warfare and bloodshed and ghastly kinds of battles and so on, create within that watery mass a place of some order, kind of like a huge egg. And in that egg, you've got a flat uh, surface that sort of trans goes right across the middle of the egg, and then, a, then half of the egg is what you see when you look up. The sky, that's half of the dome. The other half of it is what you see when you, if you could look down beneath. And water is above that dome, and water is beneath that dome. In other words, we're kind of swimming like a submarine in this great, unordered, watery mass. And here we are in a place of protection that is kind of like this little egg. Okay, now that was the ancient Near Eastern view. We know that's not correct. I'm not saying that's correct. Okay? But isn't it interesting that Genesis 1, you can at least see, in some sense, a presupposition of such a world view speaking of the waters above the dome and the waters beneath. And the entire description there, you know, at least gives some suggestion that there's that view. Now, what do we make of that? Well, I'll tell you what I think is a legitimate way to look at it is this. God speaks truth to us. He nevertheless speaks truth to us in language which, as it were, stoops to our understanding. He allows the truth that he wants to communicate to come to us, nevertheless using the assumptions that are normally associated with the way we perceive things. That happens all through the Bible. It's a constant and perennial thing, you see. So, for example, um, the Bible speaks about sunrise or the sun rising and the sun setting. It uses that kind of language. Now, I suppose if I were going to be hypercritical, I could say, well, look at there, the Bible's got this arcane, backwards view of things that obviously can't be true because look at there, it teaches that the sun rises. Everybody knows the sun doesn't rise. The earth turns. And here's the Bible promulgating this erroneous view of the universe that the sun rises. You know, yeah, I've, I've heard people actually critique the Bible on that basis, that it has this sort of ancient view of the universe that we know is not correct anymore, therefore we can't trust the Bible. What do you do with something like that? You know. I mean, it's, 
it is at least interesting, isn't it, that we continue to use that language ourselves. We talk about sunrise, don't we? I listen to the weather report at night. I, it's going to be cloudy tomorrow. It's going to rain. At the end of the weather report, the uh, meteorological reporter will get on and say, tomorrow morning, sunrise, 6.52. What are you going to do, call that guy up on the phone? Hey, you idiot! What's the matter with you? Don't you know the sun? What are you promulgating this pre capernican understanding of the universe? Haven't you heard of the, 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 you know, the revolution that we learned that now the earth goes around the sun? What are you teaching people that the sun rises? I'm not going to do that because I know and he knows, we all know, that that is simply a figure of speech describing the universe the way we see it. And even though we know better, we still lapse into that kind of language. It's called phenomenological language. We do it all the time because it's just the way we are. So are we going to accuse the deity of misleading us when the deity comes and gives us his word assuming the universe the way the eye sees it? Instead of holding God to some astro-cosmological uh, standard that he's got to explain everything, you know, according to contemporary scientific understanding, which is still inadequate. Don't you see that it's okay for God to say, look, I have a great truth that I want to give to you, and I'm going to give it to you through the canons of ordinary human perception and speech. And, it's, uh, and, and I can do that without necessarily being accused of, of leading you astray because the fundamental thing I'm teaching here is not that there's a three-storied universe and a great egg floating through, you know, a sea and that it's, uh, it's waters above and waters beneath. All of that is not the point. The point is God did this. The point is God is the great creative genius behind all of this. And for him to give us in this remarkable and lofty kind of language a description of what he did that nevertheless stoops to our faulty human perception while never compromising the great power of God and majesty of God in the, in the greater story of things is really a wonderful tribute to God's grace to us rather than some basis for us to you know, mount up and ratchet up some sort of you know, accusation that the Bible is, is in error. All right. So far, so good? Is this... Uh... You're looking at me politely, and does this, does this kind of make sense? I, I, you know, I'll tell you, I, I know people, and I, maybe none of you are in this room, I don't know this, who would be hopping mad at what I've just said. And so <laughs> that's why I, if I seem like I'm being a little tentative here, uh, that's the reason why. But uh, it does seem to me that um, uh, this is uh, what's going on. I might mention, by the way, if you take Genesis chapter 1 and compare it to the Enuma Elish, And by the way, if you ever have a chance to read that, you ought to do it. I, I will say to you that while both of them, in a, in a very kind of basic way, presuppose a common outlook, that's where the, that's where the similarity stops. Enuma Elish is just this, and, and most of these ancient Near Eastern you know, creation myths are just the most outrageous uh, you know, displays of kind of uh, what we really would call a primitive understanding. And the comparison with Genesis 1 is it's light years in difference in terms of the basic elegance and dignity of the text. There is no comparison as between the two. And yet you'd say that God is stooping to a particular view of things in order to communicate a vastly greater truth. That's the idea. All right. Now let me, uh, having said that, try to move to something that may have somewhat more practical significance. My wife always tells me, you're too much technicalia, not enough practicalia. And so this is the practicalia. And uh, here it is. What does this have to do with you or me in life as we live it? Well, think about this for a minute. There is this idea of the unordered and then the place of order coming into the midst of it. And then, in a sense, that theme is revisited in the next chapters and, indeed, all the way through the Bible. It's a motif that we encounter again and again. And the motif is simply this. You have the disordered and the ordered. And God comes giving us order and then expects us and calls us as those in his image to do, in a sense, to carry on, in a sense, what he has started, you see to, in a sense, be involved in this creative work 
not bringing things into being out of nothing, which is only something he can do, but to at least extend, in a sense, replacing beauty with what was ugly. Putting gardens where there were jungles. So he puts Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And he tells them to not simply live there in the Garden of Eden. Their call, if you read that text carefully, we'll be looking at it uh, next week, is not simply to live there, but to expand its borders. And the picture is you've got a garden in the midst of a more extensive jungle, a disordered place, and they're supposed to inch by inch, mile by mile, take jungle and make it beautiful. And in a sense, when we do such a thing, we are participating in the very nature of God himself who brings order to chaos. The most obvious example of that is just the kind of thing we do. You move into a nice house and you look in the backyard and you see weeds. Weeds. Now, I would look at those weeds and say, oh, they're lovely. That's good. And I grab a book and forget it, you know. But some of you have a far more divine spark in you at this point. I use that term very guardedly. But uh, you would look at those weeds and think, no, we can do better. And you'd go out and you'd till it up and you'd plant, you know, kind of uh, whatever you do. It's, you know, this is how incompetent. I, I get out of my element in a hurry here, but you do whatever you do to dirt, you know, to make stuff grow. And you, uh, you plant the seeds and you, you color coordinate the rows. And pretty soon the next spring, what do you have? You have something beautiful. And where there were ge- uh, weeds, now you have flowers. Now you have that which in a very, in a, in a sense conveys by glimpses the very glory of God. You see, Because beauty is, in some sense or other, little shafts of the glory of God coming into this created order. And you have had a role in opening a little window into heaven by putting a garden in your backyard. And in some ways you're doing the very thing that the, the image of God, the Imago Dei, is ordained to do, to extend the Garden of Eden right into your backyard, you see. It also can take place morally. Christian people can go into places where there is backbiting, backstabbing, I mean a jungle of human personal relationships. Where everybody is on their guard, office politics is Machiavellian, and everybody's kind of watching out for themselves and not sure who's going to get stabbed in the back next, and it's this kind of, you know, ugly situation. Do you know it only takes one Christian person who really lives a life of integrity to change the the character of a whole office? Did you know that? That happens. One Christian person, even if nobody else in that office is converted, nevertheless, there can be an influence. This is what the Bible calls being the salt of the earth. You can be there, just one voice. And to you it may seem awfully frustrating, but somehow the effect, just the fragrance of your presence can put a garden where there was a jungle in these human relationships. That's the Imago Dei. That's the image of God being extended and expanded one more step. In that case, not with flowers, but in a sense, growing a garden in human relationships. There's a great story. Some of you know this. Uh, at, the, at the outbreak of the First World War, uh, it was, that's where the term trench warfare uh, got its name because there was the, as you know, the Western Front and the Eastern Front. Uh, Germany was uh, facing both, uh, uh, you know, kind of France on the West and Russia on the East, and those trenches were out there, and and these guys were just holed up in these trenches, and it was ugly, to be, you know, to say the very least. And uh, and yet, one of the interesting things was that uh, as the Christmas season rolled around, in that first year, 1914 to 1915, uh, that's that little uh, period of time, Christmas Day arrived. And astonishingly, everybody on both sides knew it was Christmas. And in a kind of remarkable way, they first tentatively and then somewhat more boldly came out of their trenches. Germans on one side, English, French on the other, U.S. wasn't there yet. And uh, they went out into the no man's land. And they started talking. 
And they started exchanging photographs of each other and promising to contact each other after the war was over and sharing pictures of family and friends and kids. And they actually had a soccer game. Why? Because of Christ. And in some sense or other, the presence of Christ as embodied in a holiday that celebrates His birth so overwhelmed the fundamental antipathy of those two sides that they put a garden there for a few hours where there was worse than a jungle, you see. This is what the Christian faith is really about, is we are, we are expanding that place of order. God created something beautiful, and while we as human beings have had a lot to do with messing it up, we as redeemed human beings have a lot to do with making it right. And part of the message, I think, of Genesis 1 is that God said it is good. And then God invested in us the power by His grace to be the cutting edge of that goodness recovering and restoring that which was lost. And I believe that's part of the why, the why of the creation narrative. And I really think you have to kind of see it from the ancient point of view to get it, that you have that ordered place growing into the unordered place, and that that's part of what that chapter is trying to communicate. So, what do we have? We have the what of creation. It's a glorious theater. It shows us God and his glory. We have the who of creation. It leads us irretrievably to Christ, the one by whom, for whom, and uh, it was made, and the one by whom it all hangs together. And we have the why of creation, that as God is created, he's now invested in us, those who are in his image, to continue that creation project, extending beauty into the places where there was ugliness and seeing the great evidence of his grace working through us. So, that's Genesis 1. Uh, We've got a couple of minutes. Uh, Any comment or thoughts you might want to throw in here? Next week we're going to jump to the fall. The fall, Garden of Eden, Satan. It was Eve's fault, all of that. We'll cover all of that, get that straightened out once and for all. (laughs) uh, Questions, comments? Yes, please. Could be, yeah, good question. The, the question is, uh, the term day that's used, the Hebrew word is yom. It's uh, used throughout the uh, Old Testament. It commonly does mean 24 hours. I mean, that's, that's part of the argument is that the word yom, day, uh, normally means 24 hours, but certainly not always. And you'll have description, the word used, for example, the day of the Lord, which may not be a 24-hour period at all, or other uses of the word day, which can at least allow that there's something more uh, extravagant in mind there than a 24-hour calendar day. And, and I think there's, uh, there's a huge debate there. I mean, I don't want to toss that off like it's a, a non-issue, but, uh, but nevertheless, it seems to me there's at least an argument that can be made along those points. Yes, please. The uh, concept uh, that we're talking about. Right. Right, and I think you're quite correct. Uh, the question is, uh, um, Corey asking, um, where it says in the seventh day God rested, and it seems uh, strange that God would have to rest as if God got tired out. And I think we know in our best theological moments that that doesn't really quite make sense. It's not like God was worn out and had to take a snooze or something like that. We we uh, we appreciate that. Uh, it's... Uh, and. Now limited time really re- prevents me from answering that any, in any sense adequately. Uh, the seventh day is certainly viewed as the culmination of the creation week. Sometimes people say, well, it's the sixth day when God made man. Man is not the culmination of creation. The culmination is the hallowed seventh day, uh, the day of completion. And the idea of rest there, uh, you know, s- through the scriptures, it's not necessarily rest as in relaxing, but rest as in completion. Uh, and you'll find that many times, that, that notion of a, of a kind of rest that reflects something has been 
has reached its telos, its completed expression. Uh, and I certainly think that's probably you know, something of what's going on there. Great question. Good. Well, let's, uh, let's close in prayer. We'll be back next week. Father, we're grateful for this opportunity we've had to review briefly this wonderful text. The things we can learn from it, Father, we've hardly begun a beginning uh, to explore it, but we pray that these matters that we have looked at would remind us deeply that Christ is in all of this, that all of this displays your glory, and you have given us a great responsibility and a great privilege to be about the business of carrying on something of what you've begun. We pray that we would do it faithfully. We pray that you would give us the grace to do so in a manner that honors Christ our King, in whose name we pray. Amen.